When we think of the microparticles that consist our macrophysical world, we think of them as small and plentiful. A common scale to describe the amount of molecules in a cubic centimeter of solid or liquid matter is the Avogadro number, about 6 times 10 to the power of 23. At this scale, the laws of statistics can be safely applied to any system, where the complexities of many body motions are averaged out into mean field descriptions, while the fluctuations provided by behaviors of individual particles can be justifically neglected. Even if you zoom in to a nanometer scale on the cell membranes, the same statistical laws govern much of the exchange of matters. This serves as a perfect excuse for ignoring the fact that particles like atoms and molecules are omnipresent, and this is the reason why it takes so long since the contemplation of the nature of our material world for people to realize that they are in fact there. This also enables the intuitive models such as rigid body or fluid, as well as concepts such as heat, pressure, temperature, entropy, etc. This intuition, however, does not apply to everything in our daily lives. Look closer, and you find evidence of the most commonly seen particle. Well, the only particle we see actually. Photons. Or rather, the lack of it. When you shoot photos in a dark environment, you may often be bothered by the image noises. Pixel values fluctuating when you expect them to be smooth and continuous. Part of this is due to non-ideal conversion from photons to digital signals called electronic noises. But there is another type of noise that is harder to eliminate and is more real, or physical. The shot noises. When a bunch of photons travel freely in space, we describe it by the continuous electromagnetic wave. This wave can take values arbitrarily small at any given position or moment. However, we will detect them on a sensor, when one photon input is converted to a single event of electron emission, you can no longer measure the light's intensity by arbitrary small, continuous values. Rather, you describe them as discrete particles, and as photons. This strangeness indeed results from the very nature of quantum mechanics, the yet-to-be-explained mechanism of measurement, and I will make no attempt to explain it today. Interestingly, the principle behind any digital sensor, the photoelectric effect, happens to be one of the earliest inspirations and evidences of the quantum theory. A sensor pixel's photon count over a time interval, we'll call that time, exposure time, delta t, can be modeled as such. Given a very short period of time, this time epsilon, a time much shorter than that of our exposure time delta t, even much shorter than the time we expect to find merely one photon, the probability of finding one photon in epsilon is a number p epsilon, much smaller than one. When epsilon approaches zero, the ratio p epsilon over epsilon should converge to a fixed value s. We expect this probability s to be a continuous value and capable of being arbitrarily small. And this value is proportional to the wave intensity before hitting the sensor. And when the detection happens, it will happen as a discrete event, meaning that it won't happen by 15%, and there is no 15% of a photon. S remains constant over exposure time. In this way, the photon count over delta t, which we call n, is not certain. In fact, it can take any natural number values since all events that contribute to it may or may not happen. But it surely favors some integers over the others. Intuitively speaking, we expect the number to be close to be an n bar, which is s multiplied by the ratio of delta t. That is why n bar is called the expectation value, or mean. In reality, n forms a distribution picked around that mean value. This distribution is called the Poisson distribution. We use the property standard deviation to mark how much the actual count most likely deviates from the mean, which turns out to be square root of n bar. This is a good estimation of the amount of shot noises for light intensity E and exposure time delta T, and the signal to noise ratio is also square root of n bar. As expected, we have more significant noise when the photon number is low. If the mean count on a pixel is below 100, we will expect more than 10% of fluctuation on that pixel value, which is definitely visible and would be a great evidence that Take the brightest light source as example. The sun, a surface placed on Earth facing directly at the sun, is radiated with power density of 1.36 kilowatts per meter squared. This value is also known as the solar constant. It considers a wide range of wavelengths, but peaks around our visible range of 400 to 700 nanometer. What a coincidence! A photon of 500 nanometer has energy of 2.4 electron volts, 
So with a back of envelope calculation, we get the mean number of photons from direct sunlight on a 1 square meter surface per second is 3.5 times 10 to the 21. Which is not many. Which is a lot. Hmm, but we're exaggerating the scale since we're feeding in parameters way larger than we need. Rarely do exposure camera over one second or use an aperture of one meter diameter. We're also using the brightest light source existing within four light years, so not a great example. Even so, you should already notice that this value is smaller than the Avogadro number, the typical number of atoms within the size of your sun. But to give a good estimation of the mean number of photons landing on one pixel, we're going to dive a little bit deeper. First, let's tune down the lighting a bit. There are a plethora of properties that describe how bright things are, a few of which describes the brightness of the environment. The power density is from the sun on Earth's surface that we used earlier is called irradiance, which is a property that is associated with every point in a certain environment, such as under the sun. It is defined as the radiant flux received by a unit surface area on the point. Irradiance has a unit of watt per meter squared in SI and accounts for radiation energy across all spectrum. To describe that of the visible range, we use illuminance, which has a unit of lux, lumen per meter squared. Lumen is like watt, a unit of luminous flux, like radiation rate but weighted according to human eye sensitivity. This weight is called luminous FXC, with a unit lumen per watt. Previously, we used the single photon energy of the visible range to estimate the photon rate of a 1 kilowatt flux from the sun, and we can sure do the same thing with lumens. From the lumens standard definition, an ideal 555 nanometer monochromatic source has the luminous FXC of 683 lumens per watt. That is, for 1 watt of such light flux, it is considered to be 683 lumen. We again use the single photon energy to know that the photon rate of the flux is 2.8 times 10 to the 18 per second, which converts each lumen to 4 times 10 to the 15 photons per second. We use the quantity eta in units of inverse of lumen second to represent this conversion. This number should facilitate us to convert lumen to photon numbers, not just at 555 nanometer, but at all colors, since different wavelengths have different efficacies and since that's the point of having the quantity luminous flux. A camera sensor aims to behave the same way as the perception of human eyes. Well, usually it's like that. This is achieved through the color filter rate, CFA, where photon rates of colors other than green are attenuated. For this reason, lumen can also describe the amount of light captured by the sensor and turn into digital signals. Notice that in the definition of radiance or illuminance, it is not specified what direction of the unit surface should point at which makes the usage of the quantity a bit vague. Sometimes it's used to describe the brightness of a point source from far away, like the celestial bodies. In this case, the surface is said to be normal to the incoming light direction. In other cases, the quantity is used to describe how bright the entire environment appears to a certain point, like an internal area, a moonless sky, etc. This is equivalent to describing how much this point is illuminated by such environment. Obviously, there is no unique direction of the light source. It seems that then, the surface is taken to be either generally facing upwards or forward. The Wikipedia page of Illuminance and Lux gives some examples of the illuminance of different sources of environments, which uses the definition in both ways mentioned above. At least so, I guess. The illuminance of the direct sunlight is given to be 32,000 to 100,000 Lux, which we can verify from solar irradiance about 1 kilowatts per meter squared, the sunlight's luminous FXC of 93 lumens per watt. Notice that this FXC is only a fraction of the FXC of the ideal 555 nanometer light source, since all other wavelengths included in the sunlight appear dimmer at the same power, if they're visible at all. The illumination from office lighting offers hundreds of that from the direct sunlight. This means that your eyes feel a light bulb to be at least 100 times dimmer than the sun when you directly look into it. I seriously don't know that. For a better example, this means that the comfortable lighting for reading is more than 100 times dimmer than under the direct sun, although you may not feel them being so different since your pupils and brain has learned to adapt. For the most part of my life, I've just been considering both these environments as bright, and I wonder why my phone screen is barely visible under the sun. In an environment dark like this, you may find it hard to read from prints, and if you want to take a picture with a compact camera or phone, you are forced to either hold yourself really steady 
or accept your picture is going to be either noisy from cranked again or blurry from long exposures, or just straight up dark. Okay, now we have a measurement of brightness, the luminance, and we have a way to convert the luminance to photon numbers. Well, that gives us the photon count. Let's take the case with the full moon. The number of photons from a full moon entering your pupil, which has an aperture of 4 mm, is going to receive 5 times 10 to the 9th photons per second. If you use a proper camera, the aperture is typically larger than that of a human eye. Our visual refresh rate is about 50 Hz, so a significant amount of photons must be gathered within 1 50th of a second to form a meaningful frame. This happens to be close to the minimum time scale for one to hold a camera steady in the hand without a tripod or a stabilization. Longer than this, you are likely to have some unwanted shutter drags. So it seems that we're still having a lot of photons here. What do we miss? Uh, yeah. In the end, we almost never worry about the lack of photon numbers in a glowing object like the moon or a lamp, rather the objects illuminated by it. Also remember that not all photons entering the aperture will land on a single pixel. So the photon count of a pixel is only a fraction of that entering the aperture. You may tempt to think that a photon landing on one particular pixel all comes from a subdivision of the aperture. Therefore, the pixel photon count is simply the aperture photon count divided by the total pixel number. But this is wrong, and it shows ignorance over how lenses work. I shamelessly confess that I had made this mistake as well. In fact, the photons that land on a single pixel may pass through any position at the aperture. This is the reason why changing aperture size won't block the field of view or why snipers don't mind covering clothes over the aiming telescope, or why you can't see your nose. But now that I mentioned, you probably can. What determines which pixel to land on for a photon is not the position when it reaches the aperture, but the direction. At least it is so if the photon comes from far away. Strictly speaking, we should find the directional illuminance, a quantity that only counts for the luminance from a certain direction. The directional luminance is different from our current luminance, which although does depend on the direction of the union surface, would still allow contributions from incoming light from a different angle. But I don't feel like confusing you with more definitions. In fact, I just made up that definition by my own, and I don't see it defined elsewhere. Instead, we will straight up consider the following imaging system. The system contains a set of lenses with effective focal lens F, we move the imaging plane, the sensor, to be in focus of the object in distance D. When D is far away, the distance from the lens optical center to the sensor is very close to, or only slightly larger than F. We'll just use F here. The photons that end up on a pixel P of width lowercase p must be from an area O on the object in focus, if nothing between is glowing. We we'll trace the light path that goes through the optical center, which by definition of the optical center, we can assume that it does not curve its path. But we find where O is based on P. We also know the approximate size of O, we denote it by lowercase o, determined by the geometric relation. We said that the photon from P must be from O. The reverse is not true. Only the photons in the direction of the aperture will go through the lens system and land on P which is the beam within a solid angle given by a divided by d squared, where a is the size of the aperture with radius lowercase a. Not all photons that end up on p go through the optical center either. It can go through anywhere within the aperture a, and the lens will always diffract it towards p. That's just the definition of v in focus. In short, for fixed axial distances f and d, the area size of the photon source we care about is proportional to the size of the pixel and the scattering angle of the photon we take into consideration is proportional to the size of the aperture. These two quantities are factors in our luminous flux calculation. Considering all this, we have the expression for the luminous flux. 5 e is LV p squared pi a squared divided by f squared. Here, LV is the luminous flux sourced from the object per unit area per solid angle. Why do we like this property? Well, it's a property that does not care about the camera's parameters. Through some geometric conversions, we can therefore separate the expression into two parts, one that cares about the optical properties of the object, and the other involving all geometric parameters of the camera. The luminous flux per solid angle is called luminous intensity, with unit candela. It happens to be an SI basic unit. Weird. The luminous flux from a unit area is the illuminance, which we're already familiar with. The luminous intensity per area of emission is called luminance, only two letters away from illuminance we used earlier. That's LV. 
It has the unit of nit. Nit may sound familiar because it describes the brightness of your monitor. So how do we calculate the luminance of an object, not emitting light, but scattering off light? For one, we can assume that the directional dependence of light scattering is uniform within the general direction to which the surface is facing, that is, within a solid angle of 2 pi, which is almost always not true. For the study of scales though, this is sufficient. Then we utilize the definition of albedo, that is, the luminous flux reflected by the area is equal to the luminous flux cast on that area multiplied by the albedo of the material, which is mostly true if the object scatters diffusively. The luminous flux cast on the object by the environment per unit area is the illuminance of that environment. Hence, we can again use the overall illuminance values that describe the light condition of the environment where the object is in, which makes total sense. When photographers worry about dark environments, they really worry about the overall lighting of what they are shooting rather than where they are standing. Most objects have an albedo varying between 0.1 to 0.9 for visible light. The lower the number, the darker they tend to appear. Soil, plants, and bodies of water typically have albedo below 0.3, while white walls or snow fields have albedo over 0.7. Albedos of human skin, called skin reflectance, can also vary from 0.2 to 0.67. Let's put everything together. We look at an object with an albedo alpha, an environment of illuminance EV. The effective luminance of that object is about LV equals EV alpha divided by 2 pi, assuming uniform directional scattering. Use the geometry to get the pixel's luminous flux and convert it to mean photon numbers over exposure time delta t, we have a chain of factors connecting the luminance to the mean number. Before we take in the number, let's look at the part of this expression that involves lens. We've eliminated all the sizes and distances dependencies from the object, which means that this expression will hold no matter how far away you are from the object. This makes sense, since from our daily experience, things don't just become brighter when you get closer to them. Sure, they scatter off more photons to you in total, but their surface color look mostly the same. A divided by f is the relative aperture size, which is twice the inverse of the f number used in photography. For a fixed f number, the larger the individual pixel size, the more efficiently it gathers photons. This is a well-known fact in photography that really sees proper explanation, and is the reason why larger sensors tend to yield less noises. If we don't change p or f, but only a, that is, by tuning the aperture size, we also change the photon number. This totally makes sense. After all, the light gathered is confined within the aperture area. If we only change f, the effective focal length, this happens when we're zooming in and out. We see that even with a fixed aperture size, f number still changes with it. It's actually not that easy to demonstrate this effect, since for most zoom lenses, when it's zoomed in by design, it will try to maintain the f number rather than the effective aperture size a. To achieve this, the aperture isn't really placed at the front of the lens either, but in the middle. It does show here that our model is a bit too rough. Yet still, it's true that for most zoom lenses, the maximum f number is smaller on the telephoto side, and it's indeed harder to get good lighting for telephoto photography. Now is the moment of truth. If, say, we take a picture under the luminance of a typical inside area, 120 lux, with my ZS200, it has a 20 megapixel 1 inch sensor, that is p equals 2.4 micron. We're aiming at an object with albedo of 0.6. I go to the maximum aperture, f over 3.3, my hands are shaky, so I choose 100th of second exposure time. That gives us the mean photon number to be 380. That number is shared by three colors of the CFA, meaning the weakest pixel color will have no more than about 100 photons, resulting indeed in a fluctuation of about 10%.